All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Marusars. I am the a deputy general counsel with the DLGF. Here with me uh, with, with this presentation is Fred Van Dorp, who is the DLGF budget division director. Presentation today is on property tax referenda with a uh, focus especially on uh, school referenda. The agenda for today, um, I'm going to start with just giving an overview of the referendum process um, and then go into talking about some changes that the General Assembly made uh, to referendum certifications uh, as part of the process in uh, House Enrolled Act 1271. And then we're going to move on to talking about the other major part of the referendum process that was added by the legislature this year having to do with revenue spending plans for referenda levies. And then finally, Fred is going to uh, discuss some of the other considerations to keep in mind when um, doing a referendum or having a, uh, imposing a referendum levy, uh, such as uh, the implications of with the tax base and in circuit breaker impact. <laughs> As a disclaimer, before we, we begin, uh, this presentation and other DLGF materials are not a substitute for the law. Um, the content in this presentation will include some guidance that we will give, uh, especially as it pertains to new legislation. However, uh, this is not our, our guidance. It does not take the place of the law. Indiana code always governs. So we begin, uh, as I mentioned, talking about just giving an overview of property tax referenda. The Indiana Code uh, sets out three different types, controlled projects, school safety, and school operating citations are included on the slide. We begin just kind of briefly talking about controlled project referenda. This applies to any capital projects with a cost exceeding a certain dollar amount set in statute. And by controlled, uh, the term refers to the taxpayer's control over the ability of the unit to issue bonds or execute a lease for the project and statute sets out a a, a three-tiered as it were uh, structure dictating the type of controlling process to use based on the costs so for example the if a project has uh, a fairly low cost um, it is considered uncontrolled meaning the unit can take out the bond or lease without taxpayer involvement um, if the cost of the project is um, kind of intermediate or kind of like it's higher than what it would be for uncontrolled, but not high enough for a referendum, there has to be what's called uh, a petition remonstrance whereby property owners would have a race uh, to gather signatures either for or against uh, the project. And then projects with the higher tiered cost based on the statute um, requires that it the project and the bonds and leases uh, have to be approved by the voters in a referendum, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, there are some statutory exceptions where a referendum is not required. I'll get in, I'll give one example uh, in a couple of slides. So when I'm talking about this kind of statutory structure for how the cost works, this slide includes kind of a roadmap for how to interpret um, whether a uh, project is required to go through a referendum, but also whether it can go through a petition remonstrance or even if it's uncontrolled, uh, kind of separated out here. Um, whether the what, whether the unit is a non-school unit or if it is a school corporation, because that that is relevant uh, as well. The long and short of it is um, for a project to be subject to a referendum. The cost, the estimated cost of the project cannot exceed the, or it must be over the lesser of, excuse me, it must be over the lesser of $16.7 million or 1% of the unit's gross assessed value. Um, as you can see on the slides, there's some dollar figures here with the asterisks next to it. That means um, at the very bottom, you can see it's the value for 2021 only. So. For next year, 2022, that 16.7 million threshold will be annually adjusted upward by the MLGQ uh, for 2022. That is also by operation of uh, statute. Uh, not to get too much into the process leading up to 
um, the preliminary determination, but once the school corporation issues a preliminary determination on the control project and then gives notice, that begins a, a period of time where property owners or voters in the unit can file a petition with the county clerk. Um, the one exception I mentioned earlier when a referendum is not necessary is if there is no successful or timely petition filed with the clerk. Um, if that is the case, then the unit can issue bonds releases without a referendum. However, um, because of some of the um, some of the benefits or what is seen as some of the benefits with going through a referendum is the levies are not uh, subject to the circuit breaker. Uh, some units will go through the referendum process, even if it's not required by statute. So to kind of talk a bit about the, the process itself. Um, leading up to the referendum. First, the if the unit anticipates having to uh, that the project will go through a referendum, it will request the county auditor to determine the estimated average percent tax increase. Uh, we're going to get into talking about that uh, in some in upcoming slides. Um, basically, the estimated average percent tax increase is this increase to the taxes imposed by the unit as a result of the referendum on a hypothetical uh, uh, taxpayer in the unit. The unit school uh, fiscal body or school board then adopts the preliminary determination on the project. And like I said, if a petition is timely and successfully filed with the clerk, the election board then certifies the proposed ballot question to the DLGF and that certification must include the auditor's determination. The department then reviews the ballot question for compliance with statute, including whether the question is inaccurate or biased. The auditor, uh, the auditor's certified estimated average percent increases are then also posted on the DLGS website, uh, also required by 1271. Once the uh, ballot question has been approved by the DLGF, the question is returned to the election board to be put on the ballot. And by statute, the final certification dates um, are August 1st for a general November election or 74 days before the primary, uh, depending on when the primary occurs uh, in May, you would probably look at um, late February is when the certification deadline for the primary election takes place. Uh, getting into the two referenda that are specific for school corporations, um, the school safety referendum, this is a recent addition by, by the legislature. This was enacted in 2019. Uh, prior to 2019, school corporations have been uh, not all, uh, have uh, been using uh, the operating referendum uh, in part, um, in some cases anyway, to uh, increase levies uh, for school safety expenses. The legislature decided they wanted a separate referendum for that purpose. Um, is such as for op uh, operating or capital expenses related to school safety. The only um, qualifier with the school safety referendum is that the tax rate is limited to 10 cents per $100 AV. And then the operating referendum um, can be used either to increase the school corporation's levy um, for operating expenses such as salaries, transportation, school safety, like I mentioned, they can still use it for that purpose or also to offset circuit breaker losses. With an operating referendum, um, this one can be sought in tandem with a controlled project referendum. Um, that does happen quite a bit, um, depending on the school corporation's plans. However, it cannot be sought if a school safety referendum levy was approved in the last three years or an operating referendum levy was approved in the previous year. Uh, the next few slides uh, talk about the process um, and conditions for, uh, for school safety and operating, not just operating. So by law, the pro uh, ballot question must state first how many years the levy will be imposed if approved. Uh, the short description of the purpose for the levy. Also, the estimated average percent increase for residential and business property and the date of the last referendum and whether it passed or failed. The last two points are uh, were added in by uh, 1271 um, this past year. Uh, as with controlled projects, the form of the question is prescribed by statute and is subject to a department approval. 
the levy can be imposed for up to eight years and uh, it can be extended for an additional eight year term uh, through going through another referendum. Now, if a referendum fails, the school corporation cannot hold another referendum for 700 days, but uh, a petition filed by a sufficient number of taxpayers and voters um, can cut that time down to 350 days. As I mentioned before, a successful levy can be imposed for up to eight years. Before the end of the last year of the referendum levy, a school corporation can place a question on the ballot to either renew the current levy for the same term and rate or adopt a new levy with a different term and rate. The process um, for getting the uh, ballot question certified is not that different from the controlled projects. Uh, school corporation requests the county auditor to determine the average percent increases, um, et cetera. The, the key difference though is that unlike a controlled project where the county election board certifies the question to the DLGF, the school board adopts the resolution with the proposed question in it and then forwards it to the DLGF for review. Now, once the DLGF uh, approves the question, it is returned to the school corporation and then the board certifies the proposed question to the election board to have it put on the ballot. Like with controlled projects, the certification deadline is the same. So that goes, uh, covers a brief overview of just referenda. Uh, and then we'll go into talking more specifically about some of the legislative changes. First, House Enrolled Act 1271. Uh, the sections we're referring to are included. These sections are effective July 1st in 2021, and they affect the form templates for uh, the controlled projects, school operations, and school safety levy. As I mentioned, the templates are prescribed by statute, but they are changed in, in several different ways. First, as I mentioned before, they uh, include the estimated average percent tax increase in property taxes for both residential and business property. It also requires that the unit provide a statement of the last referendum date and also a statement of whether the last referendum passed or failed. Um, as a plug, uh, for additional information, please refer to the department's memo, Legislative Changes to Property Tax Referenda, that was issued on May 27th. That will include some, some additional details about the process and the changes, as well as the form templates themselves. The one thing noticeable about the changes to the form template is that the template no longer will include the proposed tax rate that will be imposed on taxpayers. Uh, the taxpayers will therefore no longer see on the ballot by virtue of the form template itself the additional rate that would be paid if the referendum passes. That being said, 1271, even though the tax rate, the form template no longer includes the tax rate uh, explicitly, the tax rate now becomes a component of the formulas for the estimated average percent increases, which we'll get into in a few minutes. So, some questions that we have anticipated uh, to come up with 1271 since we've had some time to look at the, the, the changes and try to understand their implications. So what if a unit has never held a referendum before? Um, House Enrolled Act 1271 states that the unit shall use the form templates as the ballot question after filling in the blanks as needed. There, in other words, you cannot, it, because the term is shell and they prescribe the template, it's, 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 it's stated, it's implied that you cannot use or you cannot make changes to the wording of the template other than by filling in some blanks. Um, so this suggests that the units must include a statement of whether the referendum passed or failed. Uh, however, this provision assumes that every unit that is or will be conducting a referendum levy at, or a referendum has previously held one in the past. With all that in mind, it's if a unit has never conducted a property tax referendum, and therefore cannot fill in the blanks in the last sentence of the ballot template, the DLGF will not object to removing that sentence from the proposed ballot question. We understand that the law cannot require a unit to do the impossible by basically saying that we have not held one, but also or by, by saying that you have held one and whether it passed or failed, even though you actually haven't. Um, and even, even if you leave the sentence in and you leave it in blank, that may confuse or mislead the taxpayers, which we're, which we're not supportive of. 
therefore the department will do its uh, we, we don't have any objection to leaving that out. However, we will do our own check to verify that the unit has indeed not previously held a referendum, a uh, property tax referendum. Another question is, what if a unit has, or school corporation has held more than one referendum in the same year, such as one for operating and another for controlled projects? So the ballot template just refers to the most recent property tax referendum without distinguishing further by the type of referendum it was. Uh, we recommend including all the referenda done in the same election, whether it be the May primary or the November general election, and indicating whether each referendum passed or failed. Mentioned talking before about the fact that the form template no longer includes the tax rate on the face of the face of the question. Can a unit include a tax rate, a proposed tax rate, in the description of purpose? So one thing to keep in mind is that the statute requires a short description of purpose or a brief description in the case of a controlled project. A principle of statutory interpretation is that every word of the statute has to have meaning unless doing so in the context of the whole statute creates an absurd result. Um, while the meaning of short is open to interpretation, the description is still required to be short. That all being said, the DLGF won't have any objection to including a tax rate in the description uh, of purposes for the project. However, just state the purpose. We do not uh, encourage the unit then be able to put in the purpose uh, in the tax rate in the statement of purpose and then comment or contextualize the tax rate to the advantage of the unit. We believe that will go beyond the statutorily required short description of purpose. Uh, for example, the DLGF has consistently held that it, it is that it is inappropriate to state that the rate increase will be tax neutral in light of retiring debt, especially in the case of controlled projects. So now moving on from the form template, we'll talk more about the estimated average percent increase. This is a very um, interesting aspect of 12. Uh, the, the, the referendum changes found in 1271. So 1271 has statutory or statutorily prescribed formulas for determining this estimated average percent increase. And there are separate formulas for residential and business property. Uh, the main differences between them are uh, whether you apply deductions and circuit breaker credits or certain types of credits, and then also parcel data, obviously uh, residential and business property are going to have different parcel, um, uh, different, different parcel data. Uh, the formulas are similar across referendum types, so what's, what's for controlled projects is similar to what's for operating and that's similar for refer, uh, safety referenda. Uh, the key difference is, however, how the estimated referendum tax rate um, is determined, like I said, before the tax rate is now a component of this calculation rather than uh, uh, explicitly in the prescribed form template. For controlled projects, the tax rate will be determined as a function of the debt payment and the CMAV. And then for operating control uh, or school safety, uh, the tax rate uh, should be given by the school corporation. So before we get into the the, the various steps to do these calculations uh, have some preliminary thoughts to make. First, um, a lot of the terms are not defined. Uh, for example, the term residences is not defined. Um, based on the calculations themselves, we believe the term refers to homesteads or properties subject to the 1% cap. Likewise, business property is not defined. There are po two possible approaches to this. One is to uh, refer to properties subject to the 3% cap, or you can also use a property class code basis, uh, specifically look at properties in the 300 or 400 series, or even 800 series in the case of utilities. Um, we're going to, the DLGF is going to give deference to the auditor on making the, the determinations on what's what would be included uh, for business property or even for residential for that matter. Um, the thing I would point out with business property is that if you're going to use 3% property tax cap, 
um, or whatever parcels are identified in the 3% bucket. Uh, the 3% also can apply to vacant land that is not otherwise classified as homestead um, or agricultural, even if it's not actually used for business use. And that probably would not be considered business property in the spirit of the statute. So just keep that in mind. Um, if it, it, the auditor knows his or her jurisdiction uh, uh, far better than, uh, than, than we do from a 30,000 foot view. So uh, we will give deference uh, to how the auditor makes the determinations. Uh, the form template also does not have a formula for property subject to the 2% cap. Therefore, it's not necessary to make this calculation for the properties. Um, and for that matter, the form template does not have a line for the 2% or, or agricultural non-homestead residential properties. Uh, as for the term average, this is another term that is not defined. Uh, and it becomes a significant part in how you actually make the calculations. So because it's not defined, uh, we rely on, on the statute. Um, in the Indiana code that says the term must be taken in its plain, ordinary, and usual sense. The DLGF relies on the Oxford American Dictionary definition of average as the arithmetic mean or the result obtained by adding several amounts together and then dividing this number by the total by the number of amounts. Also, we encourage that you use the most readily available certified information as opposed to anything, any estimates. Uh, a point that I would like to stress, especially uh, is number six, the form of the proposed question states the estimated average percent increase is of the taxes to be paid to the unit offering the referendum and as a result of the referendum, not the overall increase of taxes paid by the taxpayer. Um, so for example, a proposed question states that the tax from the referendum will represent an average 15% increase to taxpayers that means the taxes that the unit will impose if the referendum is successful will increase by an average of 15%, not that the taxpayers taxes will go up by an average of 15%. That's an important nuance with the form template. If you look carefully at the form template, it states that the, uh, the, the, uh, the taxes, the percent of the, ta uh, the, per the percent, the taxes will go uh, uh, paid to the unit will go up by an average of X percent, not that the taxpayer's taxes will go up by an average of X percent. Um, that is something that, that, that needs to be stressed. Uh, a couple of additional points. Uh, the first regarding the DLGF's role in the calculations, since we do have to approve, uh, review and approve the form template for compliance with statute. However, 1271 does not make clear what our role is with respect to the estimated percentages um, because the, the auditor is the one who certifies to the DLGF and our only explicit responsibility um, is to post the percentages on the website. Um, our interpretation of the whole context of 1271, uh, the referendum pieces, is to uh, that we're, we're going to check the calculations, we're going to make sure that the math is right and that none of the steps are missed, but we're not going to too heavily scrutinize uh, the auditor's determinations. Um, now we understand that units may sometimes want to do their own calculations independently. And if there's any questions about if there's a wide difference or discrepancy between what the unit has has, has figured out and what the auditor has, we will we will probably inquire further. Um, but we will give deference to the auditor um, uh, on those on that. And that relieves me to uh, my 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 other point is that we would encourage that the units and the auditors uh, communicate, try to try to be on the same page with respect to these calculations. Uh, finally, at the bottom bullet point, we also have published uh, a memo uh, in, in May that details these calculations. Um, uh, but I, I will I will mention now that we will be issuing a revised uh, calculations memo, and I'll get into why in a, in a couple of minutes. So we're going to go talk about just kind of an overview of the calculations, um, an example in, in how they're supposed to be done. I won't go too deeply into all of the steps because there a lot. Of, some of them are straightforward, but I did want to highlight some of the um, some parts of them. Uh, so for step one, you figure out the average AV of the homestead located in the unit. As I mentioned, average you have to use the arithmetic mean 
which is the sum of the gross AV of all homesteads divided by the number of the homesteads. Step two, you just apply homestead standard and supplemental deductions, taking the step one result um, basically as kind of a hypothetical homestead property and then applying the homestead and supplemental deductions based on the calculations in the statutes uh, for deductions. Um, step three is pretty straightforward um, to yield the net AV tax at a rate for $100. Uh, step four, define the overall average tax rate for the current year with any unit. There's a, a kind of four subparts for this. First, you find all the taxing districts that comprise the boundaries of the unit. Then you find the tax rate for each taxing district, for example, in the abstract or in the certified budget order. You find the sum of all tax rates, and then you take the sum of all tax rates divided by the number of taxing districts to get the step four result. Step five has two subparts. First, you just multiply the previous two steps together to get the average tax liability, and then you apply to that liability any applicable property tax credits to the average liability, such as PTRC, homestead credits, and circuit breaker credits. On this step, especially, as I've mentioned, as I've said several times before, we'll give deference to the auditor on this step um, because the auditor is going to have the most immediate and available access to uh, the local credits uh, that, that, we, that we at the DLGF do not have. Uh, step six, this is the unit share of the average tax liability. This one, uh, the General Assembly did not provide a, a sub uh, kind of a, a subpart calculation for how to, how to figure this one out. And in our May memo, uh, we listed what well, the formula that we believed would yield the step six result. We took a look back at it and we did not we did not think it was a uh, it needed some clarification. Um, so what you see here is what we believe is the what you need to do to find the step six. You take the certified tax rates for all the units funds, um, divide that by step four and then multiply by step five. Uh, kind of a, a nuance with this step has to do with if if the Proposed referendum is for an extension of operating school safety levy. Um, the we would we recommend excluding the existing fund tax rate for the current operating or school safety levy operating referendum or school safety referendum levy, I should say, um, if they are going to expire in the first year of the proposed new levy. This just takes into account the fact that the existing operating levy or school safety levy will expire before the new rate will be imposed. Otherwise, you're going to the step six result is going to be skewed because it's taking into account a rate that would not otherwise be there. Uh, step seven, you find the estimated referendum tax rate. As I mentioned before, the distinction between controlled projects and the school operating safety ones. Uh, for operating school safety, the estimated tax rate needs to be given by the school corporation. And then for controlled projects, you use a formula uh, applying the estimated debt payments over the tax base. This is the formula that the DLGF has used in the past when it, um, in the prior law, the DLGF had to make the estimated, uh, had to determine the estimated tax rate for a unit undergoing or proposing a controlled project. Uh, a bit more detail about the var variables for the controlled projects. First, estimated maximum payment. This is the maximum bond release rental payment as shown in the proposed amortization schedule. You then subtract from that any estimate, estimated non-property tax revenue that a local unit may use to make payments on the bond release. And then you divide all that by the tax base, which is CNAV plus TIF AV, as Fred will get to later in the presentation by operation of statute for operating or for referenda levies, the tax base is applied also includes incremental AV that would otherwise be allocated. The taxes there therefore would otherwise be allocated to the RDC. And then you multiply uh, all that by the number 100 in order to get a uh, tax rate imposed on each hundred dollars of AV. The last two steps are fairly straightforward to ultimately, ultimately yield a estimated average percent increase again again expressed as a percentage. Now that's for residential properties for business properties. So I'll keep it very short. This formula is similar. 
to that for residential and homestead. Key differences don't apply the homestead standard and supplemental deductions. Also do not apply the one or two percent circuit breaker cap. And then to uh, to find the unit share, it's the same formula, just the numbers, uh, the step numbers will probably be different uh, just based on how the, the statute steps are broken out. But it, the, the unit share is the same uh, formula. Uh, going back to talking about averages, uh, the question uh, that we have encountered is whether whether you can use a weighted average or median value to calculate the estimated percent tax increase. Again, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but the term average was not defined by the General Assembly. Um, whatever however better weighted average or median, val uh, median value would perhaps be uh, the, the term average was used and we have to defer or have, uh, defer to what the plain ordinary sense of the term is, uh, which in common, common parlance average just means the arithmetic mean uh, for both weighted average and for median. If the, if the General Assembly provided some sort of calculation uh, to determine the average where you, it basically yields a weighted average or just said, you know, average means median or something like that, then, you know, it, it would be appropriate to use those in lieu of the arithmetic mean. Um, but again, it's we have to rely on the plain, ordinary, usual meaning of the term. All right, moving on from the estimated percent tax increases to revenue spending plans. This was the other major change made by the General Assembly this past year um, involving referenda. Senate Enrolled Act 55, which was effective this past July 1, uh, adds a requirement for school corporation about seeks a property tax referendum and imposes a property tax due to one. Uh, this requires a school corporation to develop a revenue spending plan for operating and school safety referenda. We'll get into controlled projects in a moment. So three, th three things need to be included in the revenue spending plan. First, an estimate of the amount of annual revenue expected to be collected, the specific purpose for which revenue collected from the levy will be used, and an estimate of the annual dollar amount that will be expended for each purpose. SEA 55 also added a provision to the budget notice statute, Indiana Code 6-1.1-17-3 subsection F now states, that the school board must submit the following to the department at least 10 days before its budget hearing. Uh, first, the purposes specified in the public question or any revenue spending plans for debt service on bonds or the operating or school safety referendum tax levies. It also requires uh, submitting the debt service levy fund, operating referendum levy fund, or school safety referendum levy fund. Um, Again, the General Assembly did not define what is meant by the second bullet point. The best we can tell this, they're meant to, to refer to the budget and the levy for their respective funds. Um, but again, without further clarification uh, in statute, I, I can only offer that possible guess. It's also not clear whether the plan could be amended or what the process is to amend it. And SCA 55 does not require the department to prescribe the form of the plan. Talking about controlled projects and the and SCA 55, the preliminary determination must now include a statement of the man, maximum annual debt service for the controlled project for each year in which the debt service will be paid and the schedule for the estimated annual tax levy and rate over a 10-year period. The statement must factor in changes that will occur to the debt service levy and tax rate on account of any outstanding bonds or leases that will mature or terminate during the period. So one question uh, that I alluded to earlier, does a unit have to do a revenue spending plan for controlled projects? As you can see in the, in the answer, long and short of it is we don't believe so. Uh, there appears to have been a, a, an, an intended statute to be added by SCA 55 into the controlled projects law uh, that could and we think it was there because it's cited to in that 61.1 17-3 F that I talked about earlier. 
And given the context, we believe that was meant to be the statute that would require revenue spending plans for controlled projects, but for whatever reason, it was never found in the final product of SEA 55 and is currently not in the 2021 Indiana Code. So the best we can tell, it is not required to do a revenue spending plan for controlled projects. So that covers my portion of the presentation. I'll turn it over to Fred to start talking about other things to keep in mind of the referenda. Thank you all. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fred Van Dorp. I'm the Budget Division Director with the Department of Local Government Finance. In this last section, I want to take a step back. When we're talking about other considerations, what we're really talking about are other related topics. Everything that Dave has covered gives us an idea of how this process is going to be handled going forward. Everything we're going to cover in this last section are things that are currently in place and are not changing due to any new legislation. We're including them, though, in this presentation as a resource. Right? What we want to take a look at is referenda from three different sort of related topics. Referenda as it relates to the budget adoption sequence, as it relates to the calculation or the identification of a tax base, and then we're going to end up with looking at referenda as it relates to the tax bill. I'll say that before we get started, this, these are three extremely difficult topics. They're complicated topics, and worst of all, there's a lot of math that we're going to be talking about during this, this last particular section. We do feel that the information is important enough to include, and so before we jump in, just know that what we're, what we're looking at here is just trying to give you other things that you should be thinking about or that should be on your mind as you're considering going through the referendum process. So let's start off with the easy one, and that is referenda and the budget adoption period. Last year, in, in 2020, there were a total of 22 referenda that made it onto the ballot. While the majority of those took place in the spring, there were four that went through the, 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 the fall cycle. And while the procedural aspects of having a referenda added to the ballot, giving the taxpayers a chance to have their voices be heard are identical in the spring and the fall, what we want to explore during this section of the presentation are the additional requirements or additional steps that a unit will have to go through in order to successfully complete a fall referendum. Now, when we're talking about the budget adoption process, there are several important dates to keep in mind. Each year, the department releases a calendar. This year we released it in at the end of January that outlined many, not all of, but many of those key dates. What we, knew, what we know is that there are certain dates uh, in the budgeting cycle that taking action after the statutory due date will leave us, with a, leave us in a position with an invalid uh, budget adoption, potentially continuing the budgets and levies from the, from the prior year. I want to take a look at four of those dates. I want to take a look at four specific dates, specifically as they, uh, as they relate to a a referenda being adopted. So October 12th is an important date in the process because that is the last day to post your notice to taxpayers or your Form 3 in Gateway. What that notice to taxpayers is going to include is a listing of all your funds, your budgets, and your levies that you are planning on considering for the upcoming cycle. Ten days later, the next important due date is the October 22nd, and that's the last day to hold a public hearing where you'll be looking at those funds budgets and levies. And then we jump forward another 10 days to that November 1st day, the, the deadline for all units to have adopted their 2022. Now we're looking at budgets, levies, and then and then tax rates. And then on November 2nd is the election day. That's when the voters will get a chance to either approve or deny the referendum. The, re the reason we're bringing up this particular section is four units considering a fall referendum you will be, the school corporation will be advertising adopt and adopting their ensuing year's budget prior to knowing whether or not the referenda passed or failed. For those school corporations that went through this process in the spring, they knew before the process ever began whether or not they'd be taking these values through the budgeting process. For those school corporations that go through this in the fall, it is important that they understand that even before the 
question has been asked to the taxpayers. It is important that they are advertising and adopting, so advertising the budgets and levies and adopting the budgets, levies and rates that they are ultimately hoping to collect in the in the following year. Now, taking action before the voters have a chance to uh, make their will known will put every school corporation in one of two one of two positions, either as we were looking at an A. Uh, the school corporation will have uh, adopted a, a budget for a referendum and then the referendum is ultimately defeated. In cases like that, the department should simply just won't certify the, the, the budget that was adopted for that particular fund. The rest of the adoption is, is, is in place, but we'll find out after the adoption whether or not it'll, it will be included on the certified budget order and whether or not you'll end up collecting those dollars in the following year. It's the other side of the coin that is the, the the part that's a little bit more worrisome and that is if a school corporation fails to advertise or fails to adopt the referenda and then it is ultimately passed by the voters in those cases the the school corporation wouldn't be able to levy for that voter approved referendum in the following year and while there is a workaround that we could discuss in those particular cases that workaround will, will will lead to the school corporation collecting less than they're expecting to. So if you're considering going through this process in the fall, it's important that we know that just by the nature of uh, how the calendar is is set up, we are going to find ourselves in a position where you'll be advertising and adopting before that referendum is officially um, officially approved by your taxpayers. Okay. So that's the first that's the first topic. So there's no there, that's not a change from years past. It's just information the department wanted to share preventively. The second topic we wanted to take a look at is the referendum in the tax base, and Dave has alluded to this a couple of times during the course of the presentation. Another way to describe this section would be referenda and the TIF, and not just referenda and the tax base. So as of last month, the, the department was aware of 110 active referenda in the state and 1,041 separate TIF districts in the in in Indiana. For those units, for those school corporations that are considering referenda that have TIF districts that are in their sort of geographic boundaries, what this part of the presentation is designed to do is sort of examine the relationship between those. Rates and amounts associated with the rates and levies that are associated with the referenda and how that interacts with any TIF districts that may also be in the in the geographic boundaries. Another way of looking at the same question is what we're looking at on the slide. So we're recognizing that we recognize that we're looking at a um, at a budget order. We've got four funds in the budget order. Three of those funds are tied to a tax base of 2.6 billion. And one of those funds is tied to a tax base of 2.7 billion. And so what we're going to examine in this section is why the certified AV, why the school's tax base is different for the referendum fund than it is for the operations debt service or, or education fund. Okay. Before we leave this slide, there are a couple of values, there are a couple numbers that we're going to quote. There are a couple numbers on the budget order that I'd like to foreshadow. As we do our deep dive into what's what makes up this tax base, we are going to find out what the actual source of that $2.6 billion that we see tied to three of the four funds. We're also going to uh, examine and we'll be able to identify exactly where that 2.7 comes from. But there's a third number that's not circled that we're going to see show up again. And what I'm going to ask you to remember is that the certified tax rate for the referendum fund of 0.0920. What we know is so we're still examining that same question and to answer that question, we need to dig deeper into what the CNAV represents, what it includes, what it doesn't include. And before we can do that, we first need to figure out where the CNAV is. During the CNAV certification process, when the county auditor is certifying to the department the value of all taxable property in the in the county, one of the things that they're going to identify are which specific taxing districts each unit is tied to, or another way of looking at it, what's the geographic area that is going to ultimately fund the property taxes that are headed to these units. 
for the school corporation that we're looking at, we've identified six specific taxing districts that, that represent the, the geographic boundaries, represent the tax base for the unit. In the next step, we're going to look at information that's available on the public side of Gateway that assigns a numerical value to each one of these taxing districts. So what we see here, and it's a little bit, the, the numbers are large, but the font is, is teeny, is that both the debt service, and the, in this case, the debt service is going to serve as our proxy for both the operation and the education fund. Both, both the debt service and the referenda are tied to the same six taxing districts. Right, so 44, 49, 87, 91, 57, and 58, it's the same taxing districts that are tied to both of them. If we dig a little bit deeper, we'll see that there are three, oh, sorry, four of the six taxing districts have the same tax base. So 44, 49, 87, and 91, if we look at the value that's tied to the debt service fund and compare it to that same value that's tied to the referendum fund, we can see that they have the same amount. 57, 58 for the debt service fund are tied to 1.336 billion and 376 million. But when we look at the referendum, those same two taxing districts, those same two geographic areas are tied to tax bases of 1.376 and $379 million respectively. So what's why is there a difference between those two amounts? To do that, we need to go one more level down. And so before we do a dive here, let's talk about where we started. We started on the budget order to take a look at what the amount of the tax base was. From there, we figured out what taxing district, what, what was the what were the geographic areas that create that tax base? From there, we looked at the summarized information, the summarized totals for each one of those taxing districts. And at this point, we've gone to the, the lowest possible level. We are looking at the detail that created the summary information that ultimately made its way to the budget order. And so how does this calculation work? And when for each taxing district, not only does the county auditor ultimately certify a single value, a single a total for the line, but it's they are also certifying the amount of AV that falls into a handful of very specific categories. On the far left, we've got a column that represents the tax and district codes, and those are the same six codes that we've been looking at for the last few slides. In the next section to the right, we're looking at RP net AV or the real property net assessed value broken down between what falls into the 1% bucket, the 2% and the 3% buckets. We sum those together and we've got our our fifth column, the total value of all real estate. In the next section to the right, we're looking at personal property. And instead of breaking it in the one, two, and three, we've got that separated into two distinct sections, one for locally assessed personal property and one for state assessed personal property. We, th we sum those two values together and we've got the total value of all personal property in the in the taxing district as in the taxing district as well. In the next section, things get a little bit more complicated. And the first column we're looking at is labeled AV TIF real estate. Another way to describe that is that is the incremental value that's associated with the TIF districts. A couple of slides from now, we're going to sort of do a dive into how TIF districts, the amounts that are being distributed to TIF districts are calculated. But what is certified to us, we'll, we will see how the information certified to us uh, ultimately factors into that particular calculation. Now, we know that TIFs are separated in, into two distinct parts, not just real and personal, but more specifically, they're separa separated into the concepts of the base AV and the increment. If the increment is in its standalone column, then where is the base on this value? Or where is the base on this report? The base would exist in those previous two sections, either the local personal property, sorry, either the personal property or the real property is where the base of the TIF exists. These columns, both these, the, the next two columns only represent the increment. Now, AV withholding is worth its own presentation sometime in the future. I promise we'll do a deep dive into that. But for the purposes of today's presentation, what I wanted to cover was that in this final section, the 
AV TIF real, the AV TIF personal property and the AV withholding aren't included in a unit's tax base. Those values are subtracted from the total. So we're taking the, in order to calculate the square in the red, we're looking at the real estate value, we're adding the personal property, we're subtracting the increment for the TIF for the real estate, the increment for the TIF for the personal property, we're subtracting the AV withholding, and we arrive at the adjusted AV, or in this case, what we're looking at is the certified net assessed value. A few slides back, we talked about a couple of numbers that would be important to sort of keep an eye on. And one of those numbers was the $2.6 billion for the debt fund, for the education fund, for the operations fund. The CNAV value equals the sum of all the corresponding taxing districts. And that's where our $2.6 billion figure is coming from. We expand that to when looking at the referendum fund, our $2.7 billion figure adds that TIF incremental value back into the tax base. And so if we were to sum the 2.6 and the 42 million, now we've figured out why there's a difference between the two tax bases for the debt operations education fund and why there's a different value that's associated, a different tax base that's associated with the, with the referenda fund. So one more number I want to sort of highlight here, and we'll 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 do a, a slightly deeper dive here in a moment. In taxing district 58, we've identified that 2.7 million dollars is associated as the TIF increment. And so in the next few slides, I'm going to try to bring this entire section back together. This is an excerpt from the count from the county's abstract in taxing district 58. We can identify that there is a single TIF district in that taxing district, and we can see the value of the AV that's associated with that, with that TIF district. And so that our $2.7 million from the prior slide, here we can trace it directly to the, the collection and distribution of dollars. Traditionally, we would take the TIF increment value, multiply by the taxing rate, taxing district rate. So in this case, $2.7 million worth of increment, times 1.8529 as, as our total taxing district rate, what that would generate as a property tax levy would be $51,025. But in the case where there is a referenda, the referenda does not help fund the TIF. So the, zero, the 0 0.0920 gets subtracted out from the total taxing district rate. That rate, that nine cents multiplied by the increment is going to generate $2,534. So instead of the TIF district getting $51,000 worth of taxes, they're ultimately only going to collect $48,492. The money that is associated with the referenda, whether it's applied to the traditional tax base or whether it's applied to the TIF districts, all of that money still flows to the school corporation. So let me see if I can put a little bit of a sharper point on that. A tax rate increase due to a successful referendum, all the all the all the levy generated from that rate goes to the school corporation. It is not used. None of that will go to um, a an RDC or a TIF district that's in your in your geographic boundaries. So, as school corporations are going through this for the first time, one of the things that we sort of ask you to keep in mind is that as you are working, as you are looking at your budget order. As you are reviewing the values that are certified by your local county auditor, making sure that they are certifying the correct tax base to you, meaning if there are if there are TIF districts, are there and there are TIF districts with incremental value, the tax base that's associated with your referendum will have a different tax base than what's associated with your operations fund. With both groups, both the school and the county auditor looking at this information locally. The, if there's if there are any issues, it's easier to find, identify, and correct these before we finish the certification process. Before we finish the budget certification process. As a reminder, the CNAVs. A lot of the information that we reviewed is based on the CNAV information that was certified to us last year. The CNAVs are due statutorily on August 1st, and while the information is calculated locally, reviewed locally, and then submitted to the department. Once the, during that certification process, 
the department will make all information provided by the county auditor available to local officials. And so on August 1, you should have access to all of the information that we have just looked through. All of the information, all the pages, except for one that we looked through is information that was taken from the public side of the gateway. And so on August 1, you'll have access to your 21 pay 22 information. If there are any individuals that are listening from either Switzerland or Randolph County, I can confirm that your to your county auditors have already certified their AVs. You can find those on the public side of Gateway if you wanted to do a, if you wanted to sort of review your current year information using if you wanted to review your current tax base, that information is available on the public side of Gateway. Um, 19 days before the deadline. OK, so that's that's an absolute lot. Uh, I can see that we're right up against our three o'clock deadline. I just got one more section that I want to cover and that relates to referenda and the and the tax bill. So earlier this year, the department did a webinar that did a deep dive into what circuit breaker is, how circuit breaker works, tracing it from its roots within the tax bill all the way up to its summarization and uh, allocation to the individual units that are the individual taxing units. The slides that we came up with the webinar are both linked here. What we're going to cover in this last section is really going to highlight the maybe the last two slides of that particular presentation. We're really going to look at tax bills, uh, the impact that referenda has on the calculation of tax bills. The, the presentation uh, linked here is a, is a much deeper dive into the topic, but we want this presentation to sort of stand on its own so that if we're having questions about how the referendum will appear at the tax bill, you could find it here as well. There are additional information about the property tax cycle, about the calculation of a tax bill, or just a uh, just a good old fashioned glossary of terms that we'll be using pretty that we'll be flying through quickly here, all available on the department's websites at the links that are on the page. As a quick recap. The circuit breaker, the property tax cap, circuit breaker credits, all of this, all of these concepts you won't find in Indiana code. You'll have to find, but you can find in the Indiana Constitution. The circuit breaker has been around for m more than a decade at this point, and what they represent is the maximum tax bill that any individual can pay. If an individual's tax bill exceeds that 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 cap. They will pay the cap amount and receive a credit for anything in excess and, and anything in excess of that uh, of that particular amount. Armed with only their gross assessed value. Most taxpayers can can calculate what that maximum tax bill is going to represent. And you know, the, the reason why I say most is will we'll become clear as we work through a couple more slides here, but it. it the reason why it's most and not all is due to uh, the, the impact that referenda has on the calculations. Now, in the absence of a referendum, armed only with the gross assessed value, if the parcel is coded as a homestead, its circuit breaker cap, its maximum tax bill would be 1% of their of the gross AVs. For residential property, long-term care property, agricultural property, 2% of the gross. Non-residential and personal property, 3% of the growth, but let's see if we can take a look at that in another way. On this page, what we have is an, an, an oversimplified version of the tax bill calculation where we've got the gross AV, net assessed value, place for the tax rate and the gross liability, but we're not going to use three of those five calculations. So again, armed only with the gross and knowing what type of property we're looking at, we can figure out what the property tax cap would be. In our second column, we've got a homestead or an example of a 1% property. In our third column, there's an agricultural piece of our agricultural land or a representative from the 2%. And in our third column, we've got a non-residential real estate or we've got an example of our 3%. We don't need to know ex any exemptions or deductions. We don't need to know the tax rate. We don't need to know the gross liability. We multiply the 1%, the 2% or the 3% by the gross assessed value. And we can see that for our homestead property, the maximum tax bill is going to be 1,000. For our piece of ag land, the maximum tax bill is going to be 2000 and for our non-residential real estate, it's going to be 3000 Let's 
intra so if this is how we calculate the cap, let's introduce all of those values that we didn't need earlier to simulate what these individual tax bills are going to look like. In these first three examples, we've got the same gross AV, we've got the same net assessed value. What we're examining here is how an increase in the tax rate can trigger this, 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 this circuit breaker calculation. And so in example one, we take the net AV times the tax rate and we've created a gross liability of $491 while the property has a $1,000 property tax cap. And so in this case, the liability is less than the cap, so there is no circuit breaker credit that we should be considering. That's our base case. In our second example, gross is the same, net is the same, but the tax rate is two points higher. And so our gross liability, instead of being 491, is now $1,146. We compare that to the property tax cap, and we can see that on this particular tax bill, the gross liability exceeds it by 146. So the unit, so the individual is going to pay the $1,000, their cap amount, and we would say that they would receive $146 credit for the difference between the two. Or we could express this by saying that the tax bill will have a $146 circuit breaker law. In our last example, we're increasing the tax rate again, and now that the gross liability is up to $1,474, the credit has increased as well. So the individual is still paying a bill of 1,000 and the bill is being applied $474 worth of credit. Second example works the exact same way, but instead of looking at the 1% bucket, we're looking at the 2% bucket. As we increase the tax rate between examples four, five, and six, we can see that we increase the amount of circuit breaker loss. Yeah. Circuit breaker loss, once it once the liability exceeds the, the cap itself. The third example, we're seeing the exact same thing, but we're just running that example through the 3% bucket. So as the rate increases, we continue to see an increase in the amount of credits that are applied, or we continue to see an increase in the amount of circuit breaker loss. Okay, so if that's the setup, let me, let me gently arrive at the point here. In this example, what, what I want to take a look at is one more time how a tax rate increase of 0.25, uh, how a tax rate increase of 0.25, what impact that'll have on the circuit breaker loss. In this example, we can consider that tax rate increase to be anything that's not referenda related. So let's say you just took out a new debt and to repay that debt, you're going to need an additional quarter of uh, a, a tax rate to go by a quarter, or you successfully filed an excess levy appeal and you increased your maximum levy, and to, re, to reach that new max levy, you're going to need to increase your rate by a quarter. From year one to year two, we can see the gross liability increase. Sorry, we can see the tax rate increase. We can see the gross liability increase. The property tax cap remains constant, and so the only thing that we've managed to do by increasing the rate is increase the circuit breaker loss. By comparison, this is the facts are the same in this one, except this time the rate increase is due to a voter approved referendum. We'll note that where in the first example, the property tax cap didn't change, with a voter approved referendum, the tax cap calculation is adjusted. And so in this case, that additional 25 cents increased the property tax cap from $1,000 to 1,082. And so this time the gross liability increased, the property tax cap increased, but the circuit breaker credit remained the same. And so another way of looking at it is not all tax rate increases have the same impact on tax bills. There are a number of ways that a levy can increase and when that levy increases, but the cap doesn't, this sometimes leads to circuit breaker loss. The advantage of going through the referenda process is that it not only can draw more dollars towards the, the, the unit that passed the referenda, but even taxpayers who are at their property tax cap will have their caps actively adjusted so that they pay for that referenda or when, if a taxpayer is below their cap, they will see an increase in their tax bills. 
and if a taxpayer is at or in excess of their cap, they will also see an increase in their tax bills. So when Dave was presenting, he mentioned that the department has routinely come down on the idea that the replacement of expiring debt with a referendum debt leads to a tax neutral tax rate. Well, while that's an accurate statement, what we've demonstrated in this last section is that even with the same tax rate, with the inclusion of a referenda, there are taxpayers that can still see an increase in the amount of taxes that they'll ultimately be billed for in the following year. Okay. That is a lot of information in a very short time. We're going to leave the chat box open for a little while so that if you have any questions, you can key those in. As Jenny will say in her conclusion, we're going to be sending out the um, all of the information uh, that she promised at the beginning. But the other thing that we'll be doing is putting together frequently asked questions based on anything that you put into the chat box or anything that was put into the chat box this morning or anything that was put in the chat box this afternoon. If you do have any questions, uh, it's extremely important that you give us as much detail as possible. And while we're not looking for necessarily your name or your school corporation and the facts that are associated with just you know, your area, the more details that you give us in the question, the, the, the higher the likelihood we'll be able to include that question and an answer uh, when we release that frequently asked question uh, document. Otherwise, that's everything I have. That's everything that we have for you today. Uh, hopefully this was an, an informative presentation, give you an idea of some of the changes you'll be seeing for future referenda, give you a couple of things that while not changing are important uh, facts to consider as we are talking about the impact that referenda have on budgets, levies, tax rates, and circuit breaker. Uh, as, uh, as always, thank you for attending a DLGF webinar. We hope this is an, uh, a useful resource to you as you go through this new process. All right. Thank you. And have a good afternoon. Thank you, Fred and David. Um, just wanted to remind, as Fred mentioned, we will be sending out the presentation, the video, the survey, and the CE forms um, tomorrow. So please watch for those that come through the Gov delivery system. If you have any questions, feel please feel free to reach out to us. Um, Fred and David's contact information is there. Um, and if you have any questions about any future webinars, please let me know. And thank you for joining us today.